Let's get this train a-rollin'. I warned you not to listen to that, Gets My Goat. Now look at you. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. Welcome to another episode. Oh, sorry. Am I talking over you? Were you going to do that? Go. No, I was going to say, and and this is that Gets My Goat, but uh, you had that well in hand. You didn't need my help, sir. We're not going to save all this stumbling, bumbling crap, are we? (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay. I know you like to save it. But it added personality. Should I redo it and do it well, or should we just move on? What? I, I don't think we have enough time to redo it and do it well. We wouldn't be able to talk about Star Wars if we had to do it well. I'm sorry there isn't time. Okay. So yeah, welcome to uh, That Gets My Goat. Uh, if we were to do a countdown or a count up, I guess is probably the better word for it, of how many episodes... That we've done that are devoted to Star Wars. What would you guess on that gets my goat? Oh, I, I, I would think only like five or so. Yeah, you think just that many? With we all did one com- about Force Awakens. We did one about uh, Phantom Menace. Ten years later, we did one about uh, Rogue One, obviously. But like, can you think of others? I don't know. Sometimes we just get off on rants, and they, those probably don't count as being devoted to Star Wars. So yeah, maybe not. But how many episodes do you think of all of the episodes we have do we mention Star Wars? All. <laughs> probably. Star Wars is the go-to. It's the one thing that like everybody understands. So even like I've got a book that's about how to outline your novel. And every time they tell you, oh yeah, and you should do this. Which is, like, in Star Wars, this happens. I always use, despite the fact that Star Wars is not a novel, they'll still use it as the, as the touchstone that they can talk about and everybody understands. Because it's that ubiquitous. And it's only become more so now that Disney has bought it up. And they are exercising their right. Okay, so I guess uh, that's a good way for us to start talking about The Last Jedi. The Last Jedi. Was it difficult for you to get out to see that? It wasn't too bad. I didn't prepare ahead. I know that that's probably wise. The tickets go on sale like a month before the movie hits these days. For anything even. Even if it's just like the troll movie or something. You can buy tickets a month ahead. And I... I've never done that. But I suppose with some movies that's probably not a bad idea. And this probably being one of them. I didn't make any plans. I was uh, planless all the way up until like late Friday night. I thought, oh crap, we're going to be going out of town on Sunday. So if I don't go and see it Saturday, then I'm just not going to see it. And then I'm going to be back here with Rish to talk about it. And I'm going to have no idea what to say. And so I started checking the website, you know, you can like click on the showing and see what seats have already been reserved. So I started looking at the first thing in the morning Saturday shows. I figured those would probably be the least likely to be sold out because who wants to get up and be there by 10 a.m.? And were you right? Uh, I wound up going to the 1230 showing because that had a little bit more space. But... I wasn't sure which all of my kids were going to come with me. And so I didn't buy them Friday night. There was a lot of space open on Friday night at the 12.30 showing. But by Saturday morning, it was down to... Luckily, only two of my kids came. And I was able to get them two seats together up near the top. And then I sat down on the little aisle seat in one of those handicap... You know, the, the ones where, like... The wheelchair people can sit next to you because it's open space. Okay. And the ones we've always been a little worried about because I think, like, if somebody in a wheelchair shows up, you, like, have to move or whatever if they uh, if they need somebody to sit in your seat and you, you just got to go find a seat or whatever. And then I guess you wind up on the front row looking up at the screen. There was somebody in a wheelchair at my showing but they were fine at the other handicap area so he was fine to stand it's fine yeah he was <laughs> so i was able to stay put and watch it from there which was you know it's my preferred seat because you get all that leg room you know 
letting you speak now. Well, if you don't mind driving a little bit, I mean, I, dude, I could talk for three and a half hours about this movie. I, I don't know what you would like to cover. So if, if there's something that immediately comes to mind that you want to talk about, let's talk about it. Uh, okay. Oh, oh, sorry. So I, I do have a question for you, though, before it starts. Oh, okay. How well were you able to avoid spoilers? I think I was completely able to avoid spoilers. I don't think I, I had anything spoiled for me, really. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure that I didn't, I didn't get anything spoiled. How about you? Was that a problem for you? I, well, I avoided even the trailer, and yeah, I would say 92% of that movie, I, I had no idea any of that was coming. There were so many surprises and so many things where the story took a left turn, and I, 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 I think... Took a left turn and went to Canto Bite. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, they, they did go to Canto Bite, but... Um, there was a a big attempt to and i think it's it's it feels kind of like a new phenomenon of we must shield people from spoilers in the same way as we must shield people from conversations that might make them uncomfortable you know young people that sort of stuff we need a safe space from spoilers now oh okay it's a safe nerd space yeah there's a store here in town that I went to yesterday, and they have a sign, and we can post it in the show notes if I remember, but uh, I took a picture of the sign. I thought it was so strange. It was on their door, and then it was on all of their walls, and it says, attention, there are individuals within this store who have not seen Star Wars The Last Jedi. Under no circumstances will any spoiler or any discussion of any kind related to any Star Wars film be permitted on location. Breaking this law will result in sudden, immediate, and permanent ban from this store. Or thrown in the trash compactor, whichever will cause you the most pain. This law is in place until January 1st, 2018. Interesting. So that was a safe space. <laughs> I'd just never seen anything like that before. And uh, today I was at Barnes & Noble with my nephew, and we were looking at the visual dictionary. And uh, he was saying, look, there's three BB-8s. And a guy actually, as he was walking by, said, oh, I haven't seen it yet. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. Like a, a seven-year-old was talking to him. <laughs> Like the seven-year-old was talking to him and was going to spoil something about BB-8. It's like, seriously, like, BB-8 could blow up and it really doesn't make much of a difference. But anyway, I just, I found that interesting. Uh, whereas I, Force Awakens, they shielded us a, from a lot of spoilers. But there still was talk of, you know, is Kylo Ren going to be luke skywalker's son or you know does is are they going to kill han solo or you know uh, there, there was this kind of speculation that uh yeah i just didn't hear when it came to the last jedi well that's good did that improve your experience do you think absolutely it did because like i didn't even know that uh finn and uh captain phasma were gonna have this the big fight and I certainly didn't know that Ray was going to get taken before Snoke and uh, have this connection with Kylo Ren where they were close enough that he could put out his hand and she would reach for it, which was in the trailer and stuff. You know, it was like all of that was a surprise to me. Uh huh. That's cool. I'm glad that that worked out for you. Um, so you. Uh, would give this a positive review, am I right? You you really enjoyed this show? I did, and that's something that would be fun to talk about because I found out only later, really, that I was... <laughs> I almost want to say I'm not in the majority for that, but uh, no, I, th I, I don't know. There There is a very active contingent of people that didn't like the movie. Uh -huh. where, are, where are you? I liked it. I enjoyed myself 
while I was watching it. Uh, I'm not sure where. I, I don't know if I've processed it well enough. Maybe I'll be able to process it uh, more in this conversation. I, I've noticed that as we do our reviews of movies on That Gets My Goat, I go into it thinking, oh, I really liked that movie. And then all I do is talk about the problems that it had. And you and I sit there and basically spend the whole time bagging on the movie and then go, but we really liked it. You should go see it. If you haven't seen it, you should see it because we re- it was good and we liked it. Notwithstanding all the things that we said so far. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just went to Rotten Tomatoes just to check and see because I, I hadn't heard that as many people didn't like it either until just recently. I, I think just on Facebook and stuff like that recently, I've seen a lot of people being like, Whoa, geez, man, I uh, I mean, I liked the Star Wars movie, and sorry, I, I didn't mean to ruin things for you or whatever, but I, I did like it. You know, sorry to rub you the wrong way by admitting that I thought it was good, but uh, the Rotten Tomato score is still a 92, so seems like it did pretty well. That's like up there with, I don't know, Wally or something like that. I... I talked to one guy on Sunday, and uh, I said, oh, "How how's it going?" And he's like, "Well, I saw Last Jedi yesterday, and I'm I'm still pretty depressed." And I was just like, "Oh, holy cow! I yeah, so am I. That's awesome." But I didn't realize that he was depressed because he hated the movie. I mean, I, I eventually I realized that, and it was just like, "Oh, okay." But he's the only person I've talked to that just you know hated it. But apparently there's a super vocal contingent of fans that felt that way. Um, And I guess I'm kind of reminded of 2005 when Revenge of the Sith came out and everybody was saying, oh, this is the third, this one's way better than Return of the Jedi. Holy cow, this movie is so, so, oh, wow. And I just look around, scratch my head, and it's like, you and I saw totally different movies, man. This isn't even as good as Ewok's Battle for Endor. And so, yeah, suddenly I'm that guy, I guess, that was just like, oh my gosh. And uh, the people around me were just like, ugh, but what about this? And yeah, I haven't really had, except for the Canto Bite scene, where I recognized it's like, wow, this, this feels awful familiar, guys. Uh, this feels like the prequels. Where... Yeah, I, I've heard people say that the chase scene that they do where they're on the alien horseback, whatever those things were, that was the pod race of the uh, of this trilogy. Oh, interesting, because the pod race is quite good. <laughs> Except for the f- fucking two-headed announcer oh, yeah, good that point. I ate. And... Uh, Everything that Jar Jar has to add. Did he crash it? <laughs> and Watto. Everything about Watto. Let's see, what else? Oh, Nubian, eh? <laughs> you may have won this simple toss, Outlander. Yeah. So I'm guessing that part was probably your least favorite. But you said you've seen it twice now, right? Okay, right. And yeah, I was going to say, the first time I saw it, I was just like, ooh... Because there are a couple of moments that are just, they're incongruous with the rest of the movie. And yeah, it's insulting to say, but I'm going to say it. It it felt like something George Lucas would have put in those prequels to keep the kids laughing or or something like that. But the second time I saw it, it didn't bother me because it's like, I know what's coming after this. And you can have an hour on Canto Bite if it leads up to the last 20 minutes of Last Jedi. So you think the ending, therefore, was very strong, what you're trying to say. Yeah, holy cow. I challenge myself to talk to you about, to podcast about it without crying. (laughs) All right. Yeah, the, the Canto Bite thing was probably my least favorite part as well. In lots of ways, it just, it's weird, because, like, they're in the middle of, like, a, slow speed chase i guess it's like when the guy gets drunk and gets up on like the backhoe or something like that and all of a sudden he's driving the backhoe down the freeway 
there's like 15 police cars just following behind this drunk guy on the backhoe. And he's only going like 20 miles an hour, but the police cars can't stand up to the backhoe, so they just got to wait for him to stop. And they're just kind of slowly following behind him, and, and there's a helicopter overhead, like, putting it live on TV, and this idiot on a backhoe driving along. That's basically what this show was, where you've got, like, a bunch of Star Destroyers, and they're following behind the rebel, the re- resistance... Le Resistance Fleet, or, or whatever you could call it. They seem to have like one or two, three ships, something like that. And yeah, they're just driving along slowly, shooting every now and then just to make sure they stay in line, but they can't break through their shields and they can't catch them. And somehow, right in the middle of that, they just fly away and go off to Cantobite and then do this thing and then come back. I don't know why, but that just seems really weird that that would happen. It's just like, yeah, anybody can flee. I mean, you would think they would want to pick off anything that tries to flee because that's, you know, your rebel leaders or something like that getting away. Princess Leia is running off to get help or something, you know, and it's just like, then why would they let these guys go? Anyways, what was, uh, so was the end your favorite part? What did you think of Luke Skywalker in this show? I mean, it was not what I expected. That moment when he throws the lightsaber at the very, very beginning of the movie. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, we watched Ray have like an internal battle over that lightsaber and finally she accepts it and accepts her place as who she is, you know, going to be. And we've been searching for Luke Skywalker and I'm going to take this to him. You know, there's a sacred duty or whatever to get, to present this to Luke. And he just tosses it over his shoulder. And and maybe that's upsetting to a lot of people. I, I certainly know there are people that feel like this movie was um, sacrilegious toward Luke Skywalker. But I, I didn't know any of that was coming. And it's, I, I watched it with delight. This grouchy old Luke and then his slowly coming around by the end of the movie. And the hero turn that he takes at the end of the movie. I, 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 I guess I'm going to say I loved it again. <laughs> See, a lot of times I will read something or watch something. And in the back of my mind, it's like, well, could, could I do a better job than that? And when things are pretty crappy, there are times when I'm like, yeah, I could have done better than that. What? what? That? And this movie just kept me guessing, and I didn't know where it was going. And then, yeah, ultimately, we get our final goodbye with Luke Skywalker. And yeah, I could not have come up with a better way to kill Luke. I just, I, I was super emotional about it. and uh, But Luke wasn't killed. He just kind of vanished. I mean, why did he die? Any idea? Well, when I said killed, I meant the screenwriter killed Luke Skywalker. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, cards on the table, you didn't like the film. No, I... I, We're having this interesting conversation. I'm actually talking to somebody that didn't like it. I don't think that I didn't like it. I'm just... I, I, I haven't talked with anybody about these things. And so some of these things come up and... I don't know. I, I wanted to, obviously you liked it a lot. I think you liked it better than I did. I liked it better than anyone you will ever meet in your life. I liked it better than yeah. The Force Awakens. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. You like it a lot. I liked it, but I don't know that it will bring me to tears in any way. So that's why, like, I don't know, Luke Astral projects himself there from his far off island presumably so that he doesn't have to fight the guy for real because I, with hyperspace or whatever, he could just go and join them for real. But instead he does this astral projection thing, which is kind of confusing. I can't understand what exactly is going on. You know, they shoot him and try and blow him up and he doesn't blow up. But then he has a lightsaber fight. I didn't pay attention enough. Maybe you did in your second viewing when you knew that he wasn't actually there. Do there blades actually cross he's mostly just dodging uh, what kylo ren puts at him Uh, but but, i mean he does interact with people he kisses leia he gives her the dice Uh uh-huh but then the dice disappear at the end right it's like uh hey we we didn't forget this isn't a plot hole guys (laughs) 
I don't know. See, I don't know if he actually, if, you know, if they actually fought or if he was just dodging stuff and therefore not letting him in on the fact that he wasn't really there until later when it finally happens that he kills him, but he doesn't because he's not, he's just a ghost anyways. But yeah, so he does all this stuff and, and then he dies anyway, which I don't understand. Like, why does he die anyway? That was really taxing. Well, my understanding was that he expended all of his energy to do this thing so that the rest would have a diversion and be able to escape. There was a line earlier where Kylo Ren told Rey, you're not doing this. The the strain alone would kill you. Uh, And it's revealed that it was Snoke that was doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I, you know, this is just a Jedi master ability... I guess, because Snoke enabled them to actually physically touch and be in the same space. Like when Ray was under the Falcon and getting splashed by the, the waves, Kylo Ren got wet. Right. And yeah, my, my understanding, my interpretation was that all of that was leading to this. It was all setting the stage so that w- the audience would be able to buy, so that everyone but you would be able to buy <laughs> that... Luke was able to do this. No, I bought that he was able to do that. I just, I was just trying to figure out exactly what happened because you saw it twice. So I wanted to know if he actually, if they hit sabers together or if Luke was, I remember him dodging. Yeah, there was just a lot of, like I said, Luke was able to interact with his environment and touch people. So uh, yeah, I I think physically he, his presence was there. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to just figure that out because there was a lot of stuff that I didn't under like Yoda, his Force Ghost appearing, um, and then I I swear if I remember right he like whacks Luke with his little cane. He does. He hits Luke in the face with his cane. And he's <laughs> been dead for what fifty years or whatever. So how exactly does that work? None of the Force Ghosts have ever done something like that before. Maybe that was just because Lucas was never able to do it just the way he wanted to. And so he had to deal with the constraints of filmmaking of the time. Um, But, I mean, have we ever seen Force Ghosts except for Obi-Wan? And then Obi-Wan, Yoda, and and Anakin for a split second at the end of Jedi? Well, Yoda, doesn't Yoda come back as a Force Ghost before the end? No. When... Oh, maybe that's an empire. When is it that he says, oh, he's our last hope, and then Yoda says, no, there is another. That's when Luke is taking off from Dagobah to go rescue Han and Leia. Okay. And Yoda is still alive. All right, I'm mixing stuff up in my head. Yeah. But anyway, I just, I yeah, I don't think it ever came up. Uh-huh. Although, I, I mean, certainly old Ben could have, like, put out his hand and helped Luke up out of the snow or something in Empire if if... Lucas had intended for it to be that way. But every one of the these movies has introduced like a new Jedi ability. Right. For example, in The Phantom Menace, that thing where they were able to move super, super fast or the throwing things with the Force, um, people lifting other people up with the Force and slamming them against things or absorbing force lightning and you know just all, all this sort of thing where it's like a new thing that was introduced but i know that for some audience members i guess this was a, a, a leap too far this thing <laughs> i mean we saw luke and vader communicate at the end of empire strikes back through the force yeah and in the deleted opening from return of the jedi they're on different planets and they're able to communicate yeah it's not a new thing but but, you know, if something yeah. doesn't speak to you, it doesn't speak to you. And, and there's no way that I would be able to convince somebody that something was good or moving or powerful or effective narratively through words or through logic. You feel what you feel. And if you didn't buy it or if you didn't like it or if you're just like you felt like it was a cheat or, or whatever it is, then that's how you felt. And I'm not able to I'm not one to say you are wrong. Unless you're talking about Superman in Man of Steel, in which case you are wrong. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's just was my problem. I, I think my problem was, and, and 
it's got to do with yeah you keep adding abilities you know you you got to make that's one of those things that is kind of the deal when you have magic involved i remember reading in uh orson scott card did a book called uh, how to write science fiction and fantasy and he talked about it being very important to make the rules of magic if you're going to have magic you know magic that has to have some kind of a system and this is how magic works and you need to have all the rules set out and i don't know that he says you need to tell everybody all the rules so that they understand but you have to at least follow the rules yourself you know you can't just use magic as some deus ex machina because there's no rules and you can pull yourself out of it with it but uh that's, I guess, probably what my problem is, is with Jedis, I don't know what the rules are. You know what I mean? We've seen stuff, but sometimes it makes you wonder, like, why would anyone bother to have a lightsaber fight near each other when they could, for example, just force their lightsaber out there, you know, telepathically have it fly out there and swing around over, you know, when it's far away from them. So if they get cut they don't die you know i don't know there's there's lots of things you know they have certain powers and they got to work within those powers and th- this one was i was just confused I, I didn't know what was going on that was probably maybe my problem i don't know i mean i, I think it was obviously meant to be somewhat that way cuz you weren't supposed to know that luke wasn't there any more than Kylo Ren was. It was supposed to come as a surprise to you as it was to him when it happened. So there's that. Anyway, so the cantankerous old Luke was uh, one that you appreciated? I, I did, yeah. I, 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 we just hadn't seen him in so long. And uh, I know that Mark Hamill had a problem with it and he kept going to Ryan Johnson and saying, this flies in the face of everything that Luke represented back in the day. And I guess... Ryan Johnson was trying to say that Luke had had failed and, you know, he thought he was a Jedi Master and, and he didn't have anything more to learn. And in this failure, he goes off and decides, you know, I'm, I'm going to die on this planet and not going to get involved anymore. I, I actually read Ryan Johnson saying that Luke ha- now has the chance to do what he couldn't do in Empire which was, you know, stay and not rush off to rescue Han and Leia because that's what the Emperor wanted. And then, yeah, ultimately Luke learns that there's still, you know, there's still more to learn. Yoda says something to him about failure is the greatest teacher. And, you know, it sort of impresses upon Luke that he still has things that he can learn um, I don't know. I, I, I loved that Yoda scene because I had no idea he was going to be in the movie. And and he looked really good, too, huh? He looked like Yoda. Well, he was the puppet again. Yeah. So it was kind of a step back from Episode 2 and Revenge of the Sith. And I, I guess that bothered some people because, you know, his lips don't actually form words and stuff like that, like they did in the prequels, or two of the prequels. But for me, it was just neat that he... It was a puppet again, and yeah, I very much appreciated that. It's it's hard to explain feelings and why things work or th- why things don't work for you emotionally. Like the the character of, and I can't remember her name. I want to say like Holdo or something like that. That Laura Dern played. Okay, I didn't like her. Me neither. And the second time I saw the movie, I didn't like her. Oh, okay, me neither. And I wondered, are we not supposed to like her? Because she gets that scene with Leia where they both start to say, uh, may the force be with you at the same time. It's like, oh, no, 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 you go ahead and say it. I've said it enough. And then she gets to say it. And I, I got the impression, you know, we're supposed to like Holdo. Uh, and plus she goes out in such an epic, beautiful way that I almost feel like, well, gosh, that probably should have been Leia that did that. So that she could go out in a blaze of glory and everybody could talk about, you know, how, how cool that was instead of it being, and I don't want to say a throwaway character, but a, a less central character. Yeah, 
she didn't strike me as a commander of any sort. She didn't have the demeanor that would be necessary, I think. And she's just too cute, if you know what I'm saying. Like, she makes the little facial expressions and stuff like that. They just didn't work to make me believe. Okay, and possibly because she's in this, like, gigantic, flowy, beautiful gown. No, no, dude. It's the purple hair. And yeah, the purple hair didn't help either. Like, why does she have purple hair? The purple hair doesn't help because it makes you think, oh, you know, she's a punk rocker. Or she's one of these millennials that dyes their her hair some day glow color and then still gets a job or still expects <laughs> to get a job where you're in front of people, which is my dad talk. Yeah, in general, I like purple hair, to tell you the truth, and other stuff like it. Well, I think it's because of how much I love Haley Williams and... Uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't, I, she just didn't, the big flowy dress was just like, okay, this is, I don't know, some pampered aristocracy kind of person. You don't go to work in a dress like that. And they had another woman who had the world's largest nose as another commander, and she was all dressed in like a... Military outfit. Military kind of uniform, which made sense. Leia was dressed in like, I guess, dresses or whatever, but they were more subdued, more practical, not what you would wear if you were, I don't know, sitting on your throne and watching your court jester or something and sending people to the pit of despair and saying dilly dilly to everybody. <laughs> but uh, dilly dilly. <laughs> but she just it just didn't work. I didn't mind all the stuff that she did, although I don't understand. It's it's it was one of those like stupid movie things that they do all the time where they for no goddamn good reason do they keep the uh, person who wants to know what the plan is in the dark. Why? Why do you have to do that? Why not just say, "Hey, we've got a plan. What we're going to do is is this, okay? So, you know, you're not in charge and I'm sorry. Sit back and deal with it. Don't worry. Things are in good hands." But instead, they let him just like, you're just trying to run. I can't believe you. You suck. And she just says, you just get off my bridge. Arrest this man. Because he said mean things to me. <laughs> and, uh, well, see, that, that felt intentional. It felt like we were supposed to side with Poe Dameron. Yeah. That he was our central character on there. Not, not Leia. Not 3PO, none of these other... But, but Poe was our eyes. And we were supposed to dislike her because Poe disliked her. But I don't know. Yeah, I think that that was the case. I don't know, it just felt contrived. It's one of those things where a piece of information is uselessly withheld from a character and it causes them to do things that they shouldn't do. You know, it happens in sitcoms and it happens in TV shows and it happens in movies. It happens so much. And you just want to say, dude, just tell the guy and you would save all the problems that are coming your way. Why does everybody need to not know? What is somebody going to get on the radio and tell the Imperial Star Destroyers what their plan is? What is the point of keeping it a secret? We're all stuck here together. It's one of those things that bugs me happens too often in movies is the the unnecessary misunderstanding we're just like dude everybody just no just stop for one second and talk to each other but instead usually i don't want to talk to you just get out of here and they try and explain wait let me explain just get out of here it's just how many times have you seen something like that you know what i'm saying yeah, uh, what's his name? Uh, Roger Ebert used to always complain about that. He had some, like, name for it when all it would take was, like, a sentence from a character to clear all of this up, and they never speak that sentence. He had some name for that trope. Yeah, this was one of those tropes. But, I mean, I was just able to accept it because this was a woman in a ball gown with purple hair saying, I don't have to talk to you. <laughs> I don't have to consult you. I, I, I wonder if Laura Dern was instructed to come across as hostile and kind of nasty and, you know, a foil for this character. 
or if, you know, that's how she chose to interpret it, or if that's how they chose to edit it once they decided, you know, it's sort of Poe's point of view on all of these scenes on the Mon Calamari cruiser. I don't know. It's, it's weird when they do that, when they introduce a new character who's suddenly super important. Yeah. And in a movie like this, where there's already a bunch of characters established, anytime somebody does something that uh, could have been given to one of our principals, I always wonder, okay, well, what was the intention of bringing in a new character to do this? For example... In The Force Awakens, there was this older man who was one of Leia's lieutenants. And he had a, a beard, a gray beard. And a, Right, and the he, first scene? Well, I don't know. I don't know that there's a first scene with Leia. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, sorry. Not that first scene. I was thinking the scene where we have, uh, what's his face? Swedish dude. Oh, Lor Santeca. Yeah. No, no, I, he, he was just like one of her resistance leaders that was with them in the circle where they're all talking about how we're going to stop Starkiller Base. And I saw him for a split second in Last Jedi, and I was just like, oh, that's interesting. I guess he, he's killed when, when Admiral Akbar and all the extras are killed. But then he shows up on that salt planet at the end of the movie. And I thought, oh, well, where was he during all of this? You know, it's like, why wasn't he one of the major characters in the scenes where they're like all the women are talking and it's like Carrie Fisher's daughter and yes, woman with the unfortunate nose <laughs> and purple haired Laura Dern. I was just like, well, where is this guy? Because I assumed he was high up in the resistance. And it's just like, if you already have this guy and the actor around, do we really need to bring in new characters? And, and that doesn't, apply to resistance tech rose which is how i always refer to her because that's what the action figure was called <laughs> i felt like rose tico was quite a good character and there wasn't an already established character that could fill her shoes but it's just the the laura dern character was introduced and then killed in the same movie um and i i, I don't know she also got that epic, epic death. And I just felt like somebody that, like Akbar could have taken that, that slot. Yeah. Akbar deserves the epic death way more than she does because we know who the hell he is. We, he's been saying it's a trap for all these years on uh, Robot Chicken. So he ought to be able to at least get to have a better death than just getting sucked out of the command center when they blow it up. And there's another force power that uh, was weird. Was Leia was able to like fly oh, okay. <laughs> through space? Uh, I'm assuming that's some kind of use of the whole telekinesis kind of thing. Although usually telekinesis is reserved for using on other people and not on yourself. Is that an Orson Scott card rule? or I, uh, you know, I have no idea. I've just never seen it done. If... Jedi's could use it on themselves. They could fly around all the time, right? Well, like I, I don't know. I, have we not seen Jedi's flo um, use use that to lift themselves and stuff before? Not that I know of. You would know better than me. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Star Wars nerd, but I'm nothing like you, man. Well, I, I found it strange because it happened so early in the movie, and we had. I mean, all of us went into this movie knowing Carrie Fisher has passed and that they're going to have to address that in some way. And so when they killed Leia off that early in the movie, I, again, it was just like, it, I was like, oh, wow. All right. I guess they did. Wow. And then there was that weird hand moving and eye opening and floating thing. And even the second time, it did seem strange because... This is a force ability? This is something that she has been practicing? Yeah, that's... I mean, it wasn't Luke doing it for her, because Luke hadn't turned the force on yet. Yeah, that's the other thing, is that she has never really been... I mean, we know that she has aptitude for the force, but they've left that completely out there. Like, she's never done anything with it. The only thing that she can do is kind of feel like, oh, this person is dead, or this person's not dead, or whatever... 
she has kind of that sixth sense or whatever in in her that's all that they've ever used even in force awakens they had the same thing happen yeah she sensed when han died and i think that was about it but this thing was something totally new and surprising which i don't know i mean that at the very least you didn't see that in the trailer and know it was coming you were surprised i yeah i don't know how to address that if that was a deal breaker for some people then i yeah i i don't know that i can argue with that but i mean if i had to i'd say well we haven't seen leia in 32 fucking years who knows what she's been doing right but i'm not going to say that cuz that's yeah you know that that's one of those things that i used to do to uh, explain away inconsistencies between the prequels and the original trilogy is i'd be like well i mean we don't know until eventually one day it was just like you know he just doesn't care <laughs> yeah and i wonder some about that how much did the these new people that have been put in charge care how much do they want this to be good with the old stuff it seems like they're doing a lot of fan service and they've got han solo and they've got chewy and they had luke and weirdly now all they have is leia who is <clears throat> not available and they've done things but they've also they've made a lot of changes and that's one of those things that they talked a lot about oh it's it's time to throw this old stuff out you know he actually says it let's get rid of all this baggage from the past and we can make things all new and i wonder if that's like some kind of guiding principle for these folks, you know, we're moving on and all these old people that think the old Star Wars is are worthwhile, they can fuck off. Uh. Well, but I felt like in Force Awakens that J.J. Abrams was trying to be super faithful and venerable to the original trilogy. And yes, they said the C word in that movie. And I believe they said Sith in that movie. But besides that, they pretended that the prequels never happened. Whereas this one at least came out and acknowledged the prequels. Yeah, they said Darth Sidious. But I, I wonder And Luke if, held that uh, thing over Ray and said, wow, you've got a really high midi-chlorian count. Oh, gosh. That, you know, I, I got up and peed <laughs> during that scene both times. <laughs> I'll be glad. <laughs> no, I, I don't think we'll ever see midi-chlorians again. It, it, it's too divisive. Too many people hate. That was a deal breaker for way too many people. Yeah. And I feel like Luke's instructions to Ray in this movie were an attempt to go away from that and to say everybody has the force. The force is everywhere. Yeah, in fact, I think he says the force is not a power that Jedi's have. Right. You know, as as a refutation of what the prequels said that the force was. But yeah, I I don't know. I mean, at some point somebody is going to say we don't want their we don't need them anymore the old farts at this point they they're still trying to please both the new and the uh, the old fans and maybe i mean the, the people that hated last jedi were they old people were they people like us or were they young people i i, I don't know cuz my guess is that the old farts, the, the, the gray hairs, you know, some people will call them neck beards, which I find really offensive. Um, <laughs> I mean, it is. That's an offensive term, dude. But gray hair and neck beard doesn't necessarily go together. But I'm thinking the, 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 the people that would just be like, that's the worst movie ever. ever that sounds ever, like a, a gray ever, hair thing to ever. say. Uh-huh. Yeah, it does. Uh, although, why not? I mean, you lived through the prequels. If you have gray hairs, you remember when there were only three Star Wars movies and how you felt when, you know, around the Jedi, a perimeter create and, and, and stuff like that. So maybe it is the young people that are like, no, no, no more Star Wars. Although, and I'm sorry, I should let you talk because it's, it's your show as much as it is mine. And I can never shut up about Star Wars. But <laughs> there was a point toward the end of this movie and it was when... Finn was going to sacrifice himself to take out that gun that was going to blow down the doors 
where I realized that this was the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. If you look at, like, there's, there's parallel scenes from both of those movies, and I thought, we don't need an episode nine. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is, this is the end. I don't need any more after this. And even getting to the end and seeing the credits and, and all that, seeing the movie twice, I still feel like we don't need an episode nine. It's like I'm satisfied with the way this movie ended. It didn't end on a cliffhanger like The Empire Strikes Back. It ended like on this super hopeful note of there will be more Jedi. And, you know, there are all these kids that will know who Luke Skywalker is even though they never met him. And, you know, hope will come back in the galaxy, the end. Did you get that same feeling? Yeah, I, I do definitely feel that way. It's not as, I don't know, close-ended as, say, like The Matrix or something like that, where, you know, this is like, oh, there definitely doesn't, there doesn't need, there shouldn't be, I guess we'll put it that way, there shouldn't be any more, but it is definitely positive. It has a, you know, we're looking up, things look like it's going to be good. There's a lot of work to go, but eventually things are going to turn out a-okay. It does feel like that a lot. And yeah, there are, I mean, you have the Emperor's Throne Room scene in this. And was it just me or did it seem like a lot of the, I mean, like they set up a bunch of stuff in the first movie and then they just resolved it all in the second <laughs> movie too? Like like you were saying, it's the, this is already the final chapter. I mean, they've killed Snoke. I, that was a big surprise to me. As, as far as surprises go, that, I was completely like, what? How can that happen already? But then I guess they killed Luke too. So I guess they got rid of all the... Uh, the old guard. Yeah. You know, as you know, as you know, uh, the history of this town is now I'm going to explain, but I said, as you know, as you know, I have another podcast with Marshall Latham, the, that's the Delusions of Grandeur podcast. And it's sort of been a tradition to get together with you and uh, Renee Chambliss and do a, an episode whenever one of these movies comes out. And I was hoping that we, the four of us could get together and talk about, okay, what, what do you do in episode nine? What still needs to be resolved? What, what do we have to look forward to there? You know, what, if, if you were in charge, what would you like to cover and all that? So I, I, would that be interest you as a subject? Sure. I'd do that. I don't know if I'd be able to contribute very well, but yeah, I don't I don't know. What I'd really like to see is an episode six and a half where we find out what the hell went on between the end of Return of the Jedi and the start of The Force Awakens. And why, for example, okay, so they, they destroyed the evil empire and the Republic is back. So why are these people still the resistance? And what is the First Order? Are they just like all these people that didn't want to give up the Empire? Where do they come by all these people to be stormtroopers in the First Order? Because there's, there's tens of thousands of them, huh? Where do they get all their money to make Star Killer bases and Dreadnoughts and Star Destroyers? I mean, th they must have home planets that they rule and they tax and stuff like that, I'm assuming. I, I don't know. I just... I don't understand the space Nazis of this movie. Well, none of that was ever explained. Yeah, it's it's not at all. And of course there are books, comic books and all that, that are bridging the gap that are explaining these things. But that really frustrated me when I saw Force Awakens. Yeah. And I had at least 20 questions. And every time you and I did a Force Awakens episode, I think we did three of them because something kept going wrong and we'd have to do them again, <laughs> my list would grow of questions that I, I wanted answered. But as you said, a lot of those questions were just brushed under the rug in Last Jedi. And it's like, guys, you don't need to know who Captain Phasma is or Hux is or Snoke is or the First Order is or Lor Santeca is or Sifo Diaz is or any of that stuff. You you just, just watch the movie. <laughs> Um, so I, I guess you could find out the answer of like where all that stuff came from, but you're not going to find it in the movies. And maybe you could do a whole trilogy of movies 
that take place after Return of the Jedi, it's just not going to be possible to make Mark Hamill look young or have Harrison Ford. I mean, 50 years from now, 40 years from now, you could do a trilogy there and everybody will be forgiving if Mark Hamill is not playing Luke Skywalker and all that stuff because they're dead. Yeah. At this point, they could, oh, I mean, relatively soon, I should say, not at this point, but I mean, they're about to release a young Han Solo movie using somebody pretending to be Han Solo. They could just take that guy and then, uh, I guess, recast Leia and Luke. I wouldn't complain, to tell you the truth. I don't like being in the dark, and I'm not going to read a bunch of freaking Star Wars novels. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't been able to go back. The, the Thrawn trilogy was enough for me. That's as far as I wanted to go. And sadly, the Thrawn trilogy turned out to be way better than the prequels ever were. So there's that. We have been going. This may be the longest episode ever for <laughs> That Gets My Goat. So why not? Luckily for me, it's vacation time. My kids don't have to be up at 7 a.m. to go to school tomorrow, so I'm oh, glad so for that. Tonight is a good night for it. Okay. Yeah. But we'll what? see if my son, the five-year-old, tends to still get up, so it doesn't help. But maybe I'll get lucky and he'll sleep late today, or tomorrow morning, I guess. Well, it's still today. I mean, it's two in the morning at this point, so. When he sleeps late. We will win. That Gets My Goat will be continued next time. Run while you still can. All right, I am hitting stop. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Apparently, the creative in Creative Commons doesn't mean anything. <laughs>